Well, one more time, will you just welcome all those that are worshiping with us today for the first time and all those in the digital world that are connected with us through live stream as well. We welcome you and glad to have you out on this uh, beautiful Sunday. And we're, we're taking some time today. We, last week, we started something in here. We, we started a series entitled Weapons of Mass Distraction. I really believe with all of my heart that God, before the time we're ever birthed into our mother's womb, God has a purpose and a plan for every one of our lives. And I believe that the enemy works overtime and overdrive to try to distract us, to get us off course, to try to allow different situations and circumstances, try to pull us away from what God has for us. But I believe there are four types of distractions that really he tries to use on every single one of us. And last week we talked about the strange man and the strange woman. And how the enemy will try to use that man or that woman that tries to pull us off track or get us distracted, trying to pull us in a direction that is different than what God has for our lives. And today I want to dive into another one of these weapons of mass distraction because when you're walking in your miracle, you can, you can count on it. The enemy is going to try his best to use something to get you pulled off track. And sometimes it can even be a thing that you would not expect for it to be. So I want to read to you today from the book of Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> You're welcome to follow along in whatever Bible you have, whatever version you have. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, and they'll have the verses on the screen for you as well today. Romans chapter 10, verse 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. Somebody say saved. Yes. Then Paul said, I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is a misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way, watch this, of making people right with himself. So refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law, or we could say it this way, trying to do everything just right in their own strength. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, everyone who believes in him is made right with God. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands, but faith's way of getting right with God. It says, don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth. Don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring him back to life again. In fact, it says the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and it is in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Amen. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. And I love verse number 13. It says, for everyone, that's you and me, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul here is, is saying about the children of Israel, his people. He said that his cry for his people is for them to really know the living God and to not be blinded by their own human effort to try to find a way to get right with God. You know, human beings... We're always trying to figure out what do we need to do so we can get right with God. And in fact, no matter how many times God says over and over in his word that it is by grace that you're saved, no matter how many times he says that I sent my son into the earth to die for you, human nature still feels like I need to do something. And human nature creates our own systems, our own processes for trying to figure out how we can get ourselves right with God. He said that while searching for their own way to be right with God, they end up not submitting to God's way. And this is what I'm calling the death trap of religion. The distraction, I think, is another one of those weapons of mass distraction, is the death trap of religion. And it distracts us from a real relationship with God. Now, I want to take a few moments here to break this down so you understand what we're talking about. Because many times it's popular in our Christian circles today, and I've said it myself, we hear it all the time, that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. And I do believe that with all my heart, but I, I need you to understand what we mean when we talk about that. Because the truth of the matter is, when you look up the different types of religions that there are, Christianity is listed as one of the top five most influential religions in the world. When you look at Christianity and Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and Sikhism, the top five most influential religions and Christianity is listed at the very top. So from a worldly standpoint or, or understanding how world religions are shaped, we do classify Christianity as a religion in that regard. But what we're saying when we say Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship, what we're saying is that God never intended for this relationship with Christ to get turned into a religion whereby we have all these rules and regulations that kill the relationship we have with God. In fact, I want to give you a definition for the word religion because I think it will help you. The word religion means rigid adherence 
to a set of beliefs or practices with the expectation that stellar obedience will result in a favorable relationship with God. So when we say Christianity is not a religion, what we're saying is religion is a, is a rigid adherence to a set of beliefs or set of practices with the expectation that if I have stellar obedience, if I do everything just right, if I, if I give the right amount of money, if I serve the right number of hours in church, if, if I you know, knock on the right amount of doors and tell enough people about God, rigid adherence, stellar obedience rather, will somehow or another produce this favorable relationship with God. In fact, when you dig down to the root of the word religion, religion comes from a Latin word, which is religare. And it means to tie, it means to bind, and it means to moor. And it's kind of like, you know, if you're on a, on a cruise ship, one of my, my, my family's favorite pastimes is when we, anytime we're on a vacation, if we can find a cruise ship to get on, we'll find one. We, we usually go on at least one cruise a year. Sometimes we'll hit two cruises in a year because one of the best ways for me to relax is get away from land, get out there at sea, and just enjoy myself. So this summer when we were on our sabbatical, one of the weeks that we were out, we went on a cruise, went on an eight-day cruise to the southern Mediterranean. And, you know, normally when you pull into port, they usually pull in so early that by the time we get up and get stirring around, the boat has already been docked and, and, and the, the, the gangway is already out and people are starting to get off. Well, this particular day, I decided I want to see what happens when, when, the, when the ship pulls in. So I got up extra early. And I'm out there on a the little balcony that we have in our cabin. And as the ship got, got close to, to, to the dock, they cast these ropes, these gigantic, huge ropes from the ship. And guys right there on the shore grabbed the ropes and re reeled them in and took these humongous ropes and moored the ship to these anchors that, that were sitting there on the side. And they did it at the front of the ship, did it at the middle of the ship, did it at the back of the ship. Well, now, religion means to tie down, to bind down, or to moor. So kind of like that humongous cruise ship, the reason why they moor it or tie it down is so that when the waves come, it won't drift off and head out to sea. Well, religion, the goal of religion is to put together enough rules, enough regulations, enough things that you must do and you must not do these nine things. You better do these 12 things with the goal in mind. If you do them all just right, it's supposed to keep us tied to God. The only problem with that is that God never intended for us to be tied to him out of obligation. He wants relationship. And so one of the things that, that, that disillusions people, that distracts people, is that they start into this thing called Christianity, and instead of being introduced to a relationship whereby they fall in love with God through Jesus Christ on their own and because of the love that they have for him, they, come, they get introduced to Christianity through a set of rules and regulations and all the stuff that you've got to do or can't do. And as a result of that, the moment they wake up one day and realize, on my best day, I'm never going to fulfill all this stuff. The end result is it's, we throw our hands up and say, you know what, I can't do this. I, forget it. And people end up drifting back out to do what they think the world wants for them to do instead of realizing God never needed you to do all that stuff in order for him to love you. Yes, does he want me to grow and get better? You better believe he does. But he wants us to start from this place called relationship, not religion. Shout amen, somebody. Amen. In fact, when you go back and look at the life of Jesus, yes, Jesus came to die for our sins. But one of the key things that Jesus came to do was to introduce mankind to a personal relationship with God the Father. So up until then, all the Old Testament, the whole Old Covenant is all about the children of Israel. If you do the right thing, you'll get blessed. If you do the wrong thing, you get cursed. In fact, you know, people say, man, I wish, I, I wish we didn't live in this time where all this stuff is going on today. I wish I lived back in the Bible days. Well, you can go ahead back to the Bible days if you want to. Because I know me enough to know I wouldn't have made it a chapter and a half in the Old Testament. Don't look at me. You wouldn't have gotten past that one in the verse, in the chapter in the verse, right? I wouldn't have made it a chapter and a half because in the Old Testament, if you did the right thing, man, blessings came. But if you did the wrong thing, the ground would open up and swallow 20,000 people at one time. Fireball would come down from heaven. I wouldn't have lasted a chapter and a half. Jesus came in the New Testament. Jesus really is the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he came as the mediator to show us what a relationship looks like with God when sin is not on your mind. Oh, that's good. So you pray differently when you don't look at yourself like a sinner. You have a different boldness, a different expectation from God when you're not looking at yourself as a sinner. So Jesus came to demonstrate to us what a personal relationship with the Father God looks like. That's why for Jesus, he wasn't just God. He wasn't just Yahweh. He wasn't simply Jehovah. Jesus introduced him to us as God, our Father. In fact, that's how he told us to pray when he was teaching the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. He says, in this manner, therefore, pray. 
our Father who is in heaven. It, hallowed be your name. We know the rest of it. And then in John chapter 10, he says this. He says, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. You know, religion can't stand it when you start talking about this thing as a relationship. As long as Jesus is just talking about him as God, they were okay. The moment he said, I and my Father are one, the Bible says they picked up stones to try to kill him. Why? Religion doesn't understand the relationship side of this. Then he goes on further. I love what he says in John chapter 16 because he says, For the Father himself loves you. So not only does Jesus recognize that he and his Father are one, he then goes on and he says to Peter and he says to John, he says to Matthew, he says to Bartholomew, watch this, he even said to Judas. He says, the Father doesn't just love me. He says, you don't need me to pray to the Father on your behalf because the Father himself loves you. Can I take it a step further? The Father himself not only loved Peter, he loves you too. Oh, you missed a good place to shout amen right there. The Father doesn't just love Peter and Matthew. Can I just say, the Father just doesn't love Bishop Davis, the pastor of the church. In fact, the Father God loves you just as much as he loves me. His love for me is no greater than his love for you. And I love the fact that God the Father didn't send some surrogate to love us. He didn't send some proxy or some stand-in. He didn't send some angel to love us. Jesus said, you can rest assured the Father himself loves you. In fact, say it out loud, the Father loves me. me. Now, I need you to say it with some confidence, the Father loves me. I tell your neighbor, and the Father loves you too. Now, you ought to shout, thank you, Lord. Come on, you ought to get excited about that. If I didn't say anything else worth re- remembering all day long, you ought to go home knowing that the Father himself loves you. Come on, God is not mad at you. God is madly in love with you, which means even on your worst day, God still has decided that he loves you. And the thing I love about God, God loves us with perfect knowledge already, which means when he started this love relationship with us, he didn't start this relationship not knowing everything there is to know about us. Come on, say amen, somebody. Now, there's only one catch to this thing, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Because John chapter 14, Jesus said this, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am what? The life. life. Then he says this, watch this. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm the way, not a way, not the best way, not a good way. I am the way. Come on, I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody, watch this, can come to the Father unless you come through me, Jesus said. Now, I've read that verse, you know, for years. I've preached that verse for years. But I saw something different in that verse this week than I've ever seen before. See, he said nobody can come to the Father unless you come through him. He didn't say nobody can come to God. See, religion can get you to God. Oh, yeah, I mean, because, you know, one religion over there, one religion will tell you that, you know, if you do all these great works and if you, if you, if you get rid of all the other infidels, those that don't believe, you'll wake up one day, you'll be in paradise with God. Another religion will tell you that if you knock on enough doors and if you, if you sell enough magazines and tell enough people about the, good, the goodness of God, that you'll wake up one day and you'll be with God. Nobody else can tell you, however, how to get to the Father, the personal relationship. Because nobody can come to the Father unless you stop trying to be good in your own strength and accept the work that Jesus Christ did. Come on, on our behalf. And that blood that he shed for us, it ushers us into this beautiful relationship with the Father God. John chapter 5, turn there in your Bibles if you would. So I want you to see in this death trap of religion, how religion is, always ends up being concerned with the wrong thing. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, it says, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He says, Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, there was a pool of Bethesda that had five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, people that were blind, people that were lame, people that were paralyzed, they lay on these porches. One of the men that were lying there, watch this, had been sick for 38 years. Somebody say, that's a long time. No, say like me, that's a long time. And and I want you to get this because I want you to realize that this guy has been sick. He's been in this spot trying to get healed, trying to get well, and he's been at this for 38 years. And he's been at it for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he asked him this question, would you like to get well? He said, I can't, sir, the sick man said, 
for I don't have anybody to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Somebody always comes and gets ahead of me. Now, I've been to Jerusalem, been to Israel several times. I've actually been to this place called the, where they call the Pool of Bethesda. And you see this massive area, these five different levels of, or porches that they call them. And during this time, there was a, a, a belief, more like a mythical belief, that once a year an angel would come down and trouble the water, boil the water up or stir the water up. Most historians believe it was really just the hot springs that came up. But they believed that whoever was the first person that can get into the water, they would be healed. Well, this guy's been at, he's been at this for 38 years. Now, you understand there was no social service at that time. There was no government to take care of the blind, the lame, or the sick. So if somebody was sick for a long time or blind, they couldn't work for themselves. The only way they could take care of themselves is what you saw here in, in, our, in our demonstration. Somebody's got to give them some money. Which means, watch this, if this guy's been sick for 38 years, then he's been in this place for 38 years. He's been trying to get well for 38 years. He's had nobody to take care of him for 38 years. That means everybody in the area knows this guy. Everybody in the area has probably been requested some money from this guy. Can you help me out? And Jesus comes along. He says, do you want to get well? He says, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. That's a whole other message in that. Because he didn't ask him about, do you got anybody to put you into the pool or not? Sometimes we need to go ahead and just surrender that God's got a way to take care of your situation. Huh? He said, I don't have anybody to put me into the pool. Well, notice what Jesus said. Jesus, verse 8, told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and do what? Aww. Come on, stand up, pick up your mat, and do what? Aww. Instantly, the man was what? Yeah. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Watch this. Here's the problem. This is where religion kicks in. But the miracle happened on the Sabbath. Well, now, what is the Sabbath? Uh, in, in the Jewish religion, in, in our Old Testament, in, in our Bible, the God said to sanctify the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. The Jews recognized the Sabbath as sun, roughly sundown on Friday till sundown on Saturday. And in Jewish culture, especially in Orthodox Jews there in, in Israel, no work is supposed to take place from sundown on Friday to sundown on, on Saturday. As a result, man, the, the times that I've been over there in Israel, I mean, it's serious. Now, now everybody, just like in, in any other religion, everybody doesn't abide by it. There's some folks that are like Sabbath or not. They're going about their business, vroom, vroom, vroom. But those that are, are orthodox, that are, are fully committed, they are serious about this thing. To the point that even the times we've been in Jerusalem, in Israel, on the Sabbath day, on Shabbat, if you're in a hotel, they'll have, let's say you've got three elevators in the hotel, they'll have two elevators that work regularly, and they'll have one elevator that is a Shabbat or a Sabbath elevator. And the difference is the regular elevator, you know what to do. You get in, you push the floor you want to go to, and it goes there. Well, in the Sabbath elevator, because you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath, you don't even get in and push the button. They just have all the buttons are automatically pushed. So if you get in there by accident, you're in for a long ride to the seventh floor. <laughs> Why? Because it's going to stop at every floor until it gets to the floor you're supposed to be at. And what's so, so crazy about it is that if you get on the Sabbath elevator and you don't have to push the button, you still got to reach into your pocket to get your key when you get to your door. Right? My point I'm making is they go overboard go to the extreme to make sure you're not doing any work on the sabbath day so now jesus comes along this guy has been sick for 38 years jesus heals him and he says take your mat and go about your way and the guy happens to pick up his mat on the sabbath day now watch this pick up at verse number 10 so the jewish leaders and i'm going to stop for a second because i'm going to finish what this verse should say it should say so the jewish leaders got so excited this man got healed It should say, so the Jewish leader screamed out, won't he do it? <laughs> yes, he will. <laughs> it should say, the Jewish leaders declare God is good all the time. But instead, here's religion. The Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Wait a minute. This guy hadn't been able to walk at all for 38 years. He hasn't been able to take care of himself at all for 38 years. But that's the thing with religion. Religion gets more concerned with how you did it, when you did it, who did you do it with, than the end result of what God did in your life. And it is a death trap, ladies and gentlemen. It is a death trap. Religion gets drunk on man's rules of expression instead of seeking life-giving results. Religion gets more caught up in how you did it when you did it, why you did it, who did you do it with, then the actual results that took place. There's another spot over in the book of Mark where Jesus comes along and his disciples are eating food and the religious people show up. Always be weary when religious folks, how you know, because they come with a religious look. <laughs> hmm? 
Religious folks show up and they say, why don't your disciples wash their hands like they're supposed to wash their hands? Because the Jews made sure that before they ate a meal, they ceremonially washed themselves to get clean. In fact, the, the way it worked today, they would take this, this cup had two handles on it. And before they would eat a meal, they would take the cup and, and, and put water three times on one hand. And then they would pick up that hand that's now clean. They wouldn't even touch the cup. They'd take a towel and pick up the cup then. And then three times on the other hand to clean that hand. Then they put the cup down. They wash their hands together now with the water that is the residue of the water and re recite or declare the blessing while they're rinse, rinsing their hands. And they couldn't say any other words until the blessing was, was, was done, which means they couldn't do anything, couldn't eat anything until they went through that process every single time. Now, am, am I saying there's something wrong with that? Not at all. The point I'm saying is when our practices, when our rules get in the way of God changing somebody's life, now we've gone too far with it. Can I get an amen, somebody? And I'm not just talking about the Jews. I mean, we can bring it home to the church. I mean, how many first-time guests going to churches, man, have been almost had their head cut off because you sat in somebody's pew? Well, because we weren't a part of the in crowd, and, or they didn't know us already. We weren't really welcome. That's why I want, we, we treated one of our hallmarks. And if we don't do anything else, well, we may not be the best singers, God knows I don't claim to be the best preacher or teacher of the Word of God, but one thing we declare we are as good or not, not better than anybody else, we're going to love you like nobody's business, man. You're going to walk out of here and know that no matter where you came from, come on, no matter what your background is, no matter what your situation has been, no matter how many mistakes you have made, we're going to love you right there where you are. Can I get a good amen, somebody? But religion gets all caught up with other kind of stuff. Religion gets mad because, you know, the guy up there that says, I can't believe that guy on that stage had a hat on. Don't they know this is the house of God? <laughs> Religion ignores the fact that that guy that had the hat on on the stage, did you hear the worship coming out of him? Did, did you hear how he, how he led us to the throne of God? Huh? You'd be amazed to see at the end of the service how many people get set free by God using that guy that had the, the hat on. My point is, religion gets all caught up on all the wrong stuff. Religion will have a church meeting and argue for two hours about what color carpet we're going to put down. Instead of using that time to get on a bus and drive down and feed some, some homeless folks that don't have anything to eat. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. Come on, shout amen, somebody. Religion gets all caught up on the external stuff. All the rules and regulations instead of dealing with the condition of man's heart. And God wants us to get to the place where we recognize that you can't clean a person up from the outside in. God's got to do a work in our hearts from the inside out. That's why we tell you, I don't care, man, if you're smoking, drinking, cussing, lying, stealing, cheating. If you're living in fornication, adultery, come just like you are. Because the God I serve, he is big enough to change your heart. Come on, he's big enough to recognize you right there where you are. You say, he won't leave you right there. No, he's not going to leave you right there. He's not going to let you stay there in that condition for the rest of your life. But we can't clean you up on the outside till we first let you get introduced to the one who can save you and change you and make you brand new on the inside. Give me an amen, somebody. Yeah. Point I'm making is there are a lot of people who were going with God at one time where they were going to try this God thing. And the thing that slowed them down, it's not Jesus that they don't like. It's all the rules and regulations. It's all the religion, the death trap that comes along with religion that makes you think if you don't look a certain way, God's not going to love you. Can I just tell you, God will love you whether you got a bunch of tattoos or no tattoos at all. God, God, God will love you. God doesn't have a one size fits all. He's got a one heart fits all. If you let God change your heart, he'll take you right away. In fact, I, I'm a firm believer in this. I think sometimes we try too hard to even change people's personalities and, and ways of doing things after they get saved. No, we need to, if your personality is a certain way, if you're extroverted or introverted, if you like crowds, or if, if you're the person that comes in and lights up the room, you don't have to get real tame and docile once you get saved. God wants to take your loud little self. Come on. Put you through a Holy Ghost filter to help you figure out kind of what's appropriate and what's not. Then he wants to send you back out to go get some more loud folks. Come on. Because loud people need love, too. <laughs> and all my loud people said, amen. <laughs> now, watch this. From the very beginning of time, there have always been these same two ways of approaching God. And in the book of Genesis, we, 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 we look at it, we see it through these two trees that are planted in the garden. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, 
It says, Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man that he had made. The Lord God made all types of trees to grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful, that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, watch this, he placed the tree of life. Somebody say tree of life. Tree of life. And also in the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two different trees. Tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, both trees are in the middle of the garden. There's only one that God told them not to touch. Don't eat this one. The other one was there as well. They could enjoy it all they wanted to. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the, the Lord told them don't touch it because it produces death. These two trees represent, in my mind, two different ways of approaching God. Two different types of ways we can try to have a relationship with God. And I want to tell you, most of the body of Christ approaches it the wrong way. Most of the body of Christ approaches God from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is, which is this. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents all of man's efforts to try to get to God by being good enough and not doing evil. Isn't that what most of our Christian experience has been growing up? Most, most of us have reduced Christianity to this list of don't cuss, don't drink, don't smoke, don't smack nobody. Don't sleep with anybody you're not married to. And while those may be good things to do, can I tell you that's not the sum total of your relationship with God. God is much more concerned about the condition of your heart, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil reduces this approach to God to doing our, very, our, our level best to do everything we can to try to be good enough and not do evil. The tree of life, on the other hand, represents a whole heart surrender to everything that God has done, not what we can do. That's the difference, man. This tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which produces death, it's all based on what do I need to do differently? How can I approach God? What can I get better at? What changes do I need to make? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil has that death trap. The tree of life, however, is all based on not what I can do. It's based on what Jesus did for me. And because of what he did for me, watch this, I now respond to what he did. And that's the reason why I stopped doing the stuff I shouldn't do. Not so I can be accepted by him, but out of a response to the love that he's given to me. Can I get an amen, somebody? Now listen to this. The heartbeat of Christianity is this, that we may know God as he truly is, find freedom through what he's already provided on the cross, discover the purpose he's birthed in us before the world ever began, and make a difference in somebody else's life by giving them the true gospel. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to embrace the real gospel ourselves so we can turn around and give other people the good news. Now, there are two different things, two different ways that this, this plays out. Number one, we can do more, or we can simply accept what's been done. We look at these two different trees. Number one, we can do more, or we can just accept what's already been done. <clears throat> A lot of people live from this perspective that God will accept me if I do more. That's why you think if I serve more, if I pray more, if I give more money, if I read the Bible more. And many of us that have had any kind of a Christian upbringing have been raised to, to think this way. That's why you, you ought to thank God for your kids. They've been raised right here at Impact Church or Faith Christian Center because they've been raised to know God loves them right where they are. Well, come on. I mean, I, I used to get saved every Sunday going to church. I mean, because I just thought you can lose your salvation. You look at some girl the wrong way, God, next Sunday, come on up here to the front. I was answering the altar call every Sunday. True story. Every week, I used because I was doing some stuff. Don't look at me like that. So every week, I felt like I needed to come back to the front. Because my whole Christianity was based on the way I was taught what I can do. I, I had this, 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 this argument, and I want to say an argument, but a, a debate with another minister here not that long ago. And they were trying to tell me that when last year this time, when Hurricane Harvey hit Houston, hit the Houston area, flooded all of Houston, man. They tried to tell me that the reason why that happened because God was judging Houston. I don't get mad about a lot of stuff. That made me so mad. You know why? Because we have, we have religiously, Christ, Christianity has a tendency to get real prideful when it comes to the stuff that the world is doing wrong, but ignore the stuff that the church does wrong. And my mindset is, all of it needs to be covered by the blood. And I was like, well, no, I, there's no way you can get me to believe that, that God, God, you mean to tell me God flooded Houston and all those people that died, God killed all those people because of what? He said, because of the sin that is going on in Houston, because of things going on with the mayor of Houston, because how the mayor attacked some pastors in Houston, God is judging that city. I said, well, if that's the case, what, what's the barometer then that, that, that tips the scale? Because I promise you, Houston's sin is no greater than the sin of New Orleans or the sin of Detroit, my hometown, or the sin of Jacksonville. Come on, say amen, somebody. 
See, human beings always want to look for a way to say the reason why this happens is because you are too ugly, you are too bad, and God's going to get you. There's coming a day when the judgment of God is going to fall, but it's not today. It wasn't last year. You know what happened? You know, you know when the judgment of God's going to fall? When that trumpet sounds? And those that are Christians, we get raptured out of here? It's called the tribulation and the great tribulation. Seven years of the judgment of God falling upon this earth, but God's not killing folks in Houston or in North Carolina. Because if that's the case, we got to look at every single situation that happens and say, this must have been God judging them. And this must have been, and that car accident must have been God judging them. And the reason, you know what happens when people start looking at it that way? Folks look up and go, if that's the kind of God you serve? No. No. For God so loved the world. Come on, that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I love what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10. It says, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Thank you, Lord. The message Bible says it was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. By that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. I like Ephesians chapter 2. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift. Somebody say it's a gift. Yeah. Come on, somebody say it's a gift. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should be able to boast. One of the hardest things for Christians, including pastors, to get our heads wrapped around is the reality of what Jesus already did for us. Our gratitude for what he did should be the motivation for why we serve and why we pray and why we read our Bible, why we give. In other words, we read our Bibles not so we can get more knowledge. We read our Bibles so we can get to know and get closer to the Jesus that the Bible is talking about. Everything we do, watch this, has got to be birthed out of this relationship because the moment we put it in the context of just doing it so we can be right or be accepted, we've just now eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it brings death. You know why? Because the, moment, the day you get up and you forget to do your devotional, the moment you haven't read as many scriptures as somebody else, you haven't prayed as long, the enemy will tell you the reason why that happened to you is because you haven't been reading your Bible like you should. You know what just happened? The enemy just used that situation to try to bring death to this beautiful relationship you have with Jesus Christ. No, God wants you to read your Bible because it'll bless you. It'll pull you closer into this beautiful relationship. But if you never read your Bible another day in your life, God's going to still love you the way he loves you right now. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Second thing that we, we realize is the difference between these two trees. Where one, we can earn God's approval or we can simply receive his love. We can earn God's approval, or we can simply receive his love. In other words, I can live my life trying to do the things that I believe will make God pleased with me, or I can just embrace this reality that God has already accepted me as is. Anybody glad God has accepted you as is? I can't hear you. Anybody glad he's accepted you as is? See, the thing about God accepting us as is, God accepts us as is with perfect knowledge. You, know, you accept your spouse as is. I married April 25 years ago. Accepted her as is. But how many know there's some stuff you learned about your spouse over the years? You're like, girl, I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> you learned some stuff. God's not learning anything new about us. Which means when he decided to love us, he loved us with perfect knowledge because he already knows everything there is to know about us. Romans chapter 5 says God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatsoever to him. I love Ephesians 1. It says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. God has already accepted you. And for some of you, that's a revelation you need to walk out of here with today. God has already accepted you, which means you don't have to sing one more song. You don't have to give one more dime in the offering. Come on, you don't have to serve one more time on the usher team for God to love you. And for some of you, that's a revelation because some of you have come from a background where the only way you've been accepted is you got to jump through another hoop. You got to do another dance. You got to perform another miracle for somebody. And then when you've done those things, they change the rules and you got to do something else next week. Well, God is not that way. Come on, shout amen, somebody. God decided to love you. Come on, He's decided to accept you. And He loves you right there where you are. He loves you on your best day. He loves you on your worst day. He loves you when you're doing everything just right. And can I tell you, He loves you when you have fallen flat on your face and have turned your back on Him. And it is the love of God that brings us back to this place of repentance. 
Not because we're afraid of what he's going to do, but because we love him so much, we don't want to be without him. It's the love of God that draws us back to God. The third difference between these two trees, as I wrap up, is that we can obey God out of duty, or we can obey God out of delight. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, we obey him out of duty. I got, I got to do this. I got to serve today. Here at the church, it's 6 in the morning. Well, I got to serve. But we can obey him out of delight. Why are you getting up so early? Going, oh, you just don't understand. I get to serve today, man. Oh, man. I get to lift my hands and worship God today. We can do it out of duty. We can do it out of delight. Death does it out of duty. But this tree of life, we do it out of delight. It's not a got to do. It's a get to do. We understand that in our relationships, man. Nobody wants to be with somebody anywhere. Yeah, I guess I got to take you to the movies. Come on, Frank, let's go. No, you want to be with somebody that if they got 15 other things they could be doing, they'd still rather be with you. This past Thursday, man, I was wrapping up in the office and it had been a long day. And I had been in the office, I think it's like 7.30, 7.45 that morning, had meetings all day long. And we're getting ready for this movie mania coming up next month. Don't miss movie mania. Oh, it's going to be good. I've been editing my, my sermon notes, my script for the movies, and it's going to be good. It's all I can tell you. So I was in here late doing that, and when I got done with that, I was finishing up my notes for, for, for Sunday and sending them off to the team so they can have them on the screens for you. Then I stopped over at our, our, our school, Impact Christian Academy, had an open house. I stopped in there to say hey to some of the, the, the parents. And then when I was on my way out trying to leave, and then I'm cutting across the auditorium, and the worship team is in here worshiping, and I just got caught up to the third heavens while they worshiping God. And by the time I looked up, it was a quarter to seven before I'm even getting in my car to head out of here. Well, Thursday nights is my date night with my wife. Every week, we, 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 if, we, if I'm in town, we're on a date. And so I, I call home when I'm getting in the car. And you ever call home, brothers, and you can tell from her, your wife's voice, I'm in trouble. And it's not what she said, but how she said. I'm on my way home. She said, okay. I was like, well, shunda de bocote de de I better start praying now because I'm in trouble. And I know what she was thinking. It's quarter to seven, and I'm leaving so late. She probably thinking we're not going to do it. She probably think he forgot his date night. And so then I said, I said, well, you know, you, you, you do realize it's date night. Are, are you ready to go? She said, huh? I said, are you ready to go? Because I'm sure in her mind she's probably thinking, well, he probably is tired now. He's not going to want to do it. Well, only when it's a got to do. When it's a get to do, I'm just as excited about going out with her as she is going out with me. So I say, oh, no, 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 sweetheart, no. Uh, be, be sure you're ready. I'll be home in 15 minutes. I say, all I need to do is change my shoes. I'll be ready to head right back out of the house. You'll be amazed. Watch this, how the joy of the Lord came into our conversation. <laughs> the spirit of the living God showed up on the phone. Hey! <laughs> my baby got all nice and stuff. <laughs> our relationship with God is never supposed to be a got to do. And if you've been wearing that got-to-do hat that somebody put on you, take it off and throw it away, man. Don't do what you do for God because you have to. Do it because you want to, man. I love God. He's accepted me right where I am. If everybody in my life walked away from God, I'd still be running toward Jesus. Because he's accepted me right where I am. And I'll never turn my back on him. Come on, lift up your hands. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you that your mercy endures forever. Thank you that your love is everlasting. Thank you, Father God, that you continue to show yourself strong on our behalf. And I pray right now, Lord, that you speak to our hearts and just help us understand, Lord, where we are and the condition of our hearts. For every person sitting in here right now, Father, I pray that you would help us to realize that no matter what our situation or circumstance may be, you love us right where we are. And you're the one that's inviting us into this beautiful relationship, not religion, this beautiful relationship with you, but it only happens through Jesus Christ. Now look up here at me for just a moment. I want to ask you the most important question I've asked all day long, and that is if you were to get up out of here right now and walk out of here and get into the parking lot and breathe your last breath, do you know where you'd go? I don't mean do, do you know where you'd like to go, because Hollywood says that everybody dies and they drift to the bright light. I'm not saying what would happen to your body. Your body would fall over to the ground, and we call the paramedics. They, they come and rush you off to a hospital. I'm saying if you breathe your last breath when you walked out of here today, do you know where you would go, the real you, the one that lives inside of that body? Because there are only two choices. The moment we breathe our last breath, hear me well when I say this. 
when we breathe our last breath, whether you're 95 or whether you're 15, we breathe our last breath, we either go straight to heaven to be with the Father God, or we go straight to hell to be tormented for the rest of eternity. The truth of the matter is, it's not based on your good deeds on one scale and your bad deeds on the other one to see which one's going to outweigh the other. It's based on whether or not you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. If you believe there's nobody that can get to the Father except they come through him. See, God already knows everything about you and me. He knows every sin you've committed. He knows the ones you'll commit in the future. And he still decided to put his love on you. He bet on you. Amen. Now I'm asking you today, will you bet on yourself? Will you give me a chance today to pray a simple prayer with you? If you don't know for sure where you'd go if you breathed your last breath, will you let me pray for you today? All I'm going to do is pray what we started in Romans chapter 10 and ask you to confess Jesus as your Lord, believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and the Bible says you'll be saved. See, God never asked you to be perfect. He asked you to be committed. When you commit, surrender your life to Jesus Christ, God will take you right there where you are, and he'll change you from the inside out. And here at Impact Church, I'm not going to ask you to stand up and come here to the front of the church. I'm not going to ask you to tell the church about your mistakes. And today, I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. The reason why we gave everybody in here one of those response cards when you came in, if you take that card out for me right now, everybody, everybody, if you would, even if you've been here for 20 plus years, take that card out. Because this card pertains to everybody in here. There's an answer on this card for every one of us in here. If you didn't get one, just lift your hand up and keep it up for me. I'm going to ask the ushers to quickly get those cards to people. If you didn't get one, raise your hand. Our team will be there quickly as we can to get you one of these. While you get in that car, will you listen at the same time? Because everybody in here fits this category of either A, B, C, or D on that card. And the A category simply means this. I already have an established relationship with Jesus Christ. I know without a doubt, if I were to breathe my last breath, I'd go straight to heaven to be with the Lord. If that's you, then I'm going to ask you to check that A box if you already have an established relationship. But there are a ton of you in here, and this B box pertains to you. The B box says, I'm ready to begin a relationship with Jesus today. Or for some of you, I'm ready to begin again. I, I, I was walking with God, and I've just kind of gotten away from him, drifted off track, and I'm ready to come back and begin again this relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's you, check that box, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a few minutes. It's going to transform your life forever. Then there's some of you in that C box pertains to you, and that is, I need more time to consider this. Heard what you said today, enjoyed the service. I just need a little bit more time. If that's genuinely where you are, check that C box for me. And then there might be some of you in here that could very well even be the D box. And the D box is simply this. I don't plan to ever make that decision to give my heart to Jesus. I pray that that's not the case, but if it is, I'm going to ask you, would you be courageous enough to check that box? You say, what, what happens if I check that box? We're not going to call you. We're not going to try to change your mind. What I'm going to do is just pray for you. In fact, this Easter, we did the same thing, and I had three people that checked the D box, and I've been carrying their three cards around with me since Easter. I pray for them on a regular basis, and I'm believing God that God will protect them and keep them safe long enough for their hearts to continue to let God work with them. So if that's genuinely where you are, check that box. So A, I already have a relationship with Jesus. B, I'm ready today to begin or begin again that relationship. C, I need more time to consider this. Or D, I don't plan to ever make that decision. Go ahead and check whichever box pertains to you right now. If you would, come put your name on that card. If you happen to be a first-time guest, there's a spot there for you to check that box as well. And I'm going to ask everybody in here to pray this prayer along with me. And if you're one of those that check that B box, this prayer we're getting ready to pray right here, it'll change your life forever if you believe this with all your heart. Everybody say this. Close your eyes if you would. Say this with me. Say, Dear God in heaven. Come on, say it like you mean it. Dear God in heaven, I believe with all of my heart that Jesus is your son. He died for me, paid the price for my sin. I also believe you raised him from the dead. And he's alive right now. I'm asking you, Jesus, come into my heart now. Save me now. Forgive me for trying to live this life without you. I cannot promise to be perfect all of my days, but I make this one commitment. I surrender my whole life to you. Come on, I surrender my whole life to you. 
for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put your hands together. Help me celebrate. Come on, you can do better than help me celebrate. Praise God. Now, whatever box you checked, would you please fill that card out? Just give us the basic information to ask for. In a few minutes, it's going to be offering time. Put that card into the offering bucket or just give it to one of these ushers in the blue shirts. If you check the B box, we're not going to harass you. I want to just personally send you a letter to let you know what next step should I take. Giving my heart to God, I began a relationship with Jesus today. What are the next steps I need to take so I can now begin to grow in this wonderful relationship with God?